coming up on the Branding Deep Dive podcast. And by the way, can we talk about the Branding Deep Dive effect a little bit? Are we allowed to do that? What was that? Dude, like what is the branding we deep can dive go effect? through all these episodes and like everyone made it big in some form or another after they've been on Branding Deep Dive. Oh, really? <laughs> the Kyrie, I Kyrie thing. So after uh, Omar Lias came on Branding Deep Dive, Kyrie Irving made a donation to Pani. Oh, yeah. And that was like huge <laughs> in, uh, in like, it was all over like ESPN, Bleacher Report, all this stuff, right? And I was like, I was yeah. doing I was like, hey, man, like, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But, um, and then uh, if you remember Gerard, when he came on, so Gerard, like, I think it was a couple of weeks ago where he posted, like, he was like resident of the month at like uh, oh, yeah. Henry Ford or whatever. And I, I like, did yeah. my story, I like, uh, I shared it in my story and I was like, uh, Gerard wins resident of the month after he was on Branding Deep Dive. Coincidence? <laughs> Didn't think so. <laughs> yeah. And then, there you go. and then like talking about launch good, right? This, this campaign that just happened with like, uh, like Gigi Hadid and all these like other celebrities after Branding Deep Dive episode BDD. came out. This is Abdul Manan and welcome to the Branding Deep Dive podcast. If you're new here, this is a podcast where we have in-depth discussions about what brands are doing well to drive customer loyalty and how you can take those principles and apply them to your own brand. Today, we are here to talk with the main host of the Branding Deep Dive podcast, Ahmed Shima, to review the 2021 season. In this episode, we dive into the key takeaways we had from each of our 2021 episodes and reflect on the lessons that we learned. Now, here's Ahmed Shima. Hey, can we can we start with the elephant in the room? Yeah, what's the elephant in the room? What do you mean? You don't know what the elephant in the room is? You're oh, back the, on the, the podcast. fact that I haven't been. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I had to come back for the uh, wrap up so that we have scheduled. What's going on? What's your involvement? Are you are you a part of this or not? What's, I think the audience is all wondering. Like, is this Amachima show? Yeah. Is this Amachima and Abdul Manan? Or like, what's going on? Can can we address that for the audience? I'd say. I would say this is definitely an Amachima show. I had to drop out about halfway through this season, 2021. Uh, started my fourth year of med school, so I got real busy with application season and stuff. But, uh, you know, I've been listening. I've been listening, contributing back end, meaning like, you know, putting together the uh, source material, uh, getting some questions together about what questions we should be asking on some episodes and uh, doing some graphic design as well. So that's where I'm at. And hopefully, you know, I actually was, you know, it's funny, I was thinking about it. And I was thinking like, man, our episodes are pretty good. They're getting better and better. And I feel like I kind of want to jump back on this. So we'll see what 2022 holds. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to review this episode. We're reviewing our 2021 podcast, epi- uh, podcast uh, episodes. Uh, we've got like 22, I think, and some shorts. Uh, so basically the way this is going to run, you know, if you've been listening to our podcast, we have key takeaways at the end of each episode. So we're going to run through those key takeaways. Uh, the deliverables that we've been able to pull out from each episode uh, and see if we can remember what they're about and uh, what, uh, if, you know, just reflect on uh, on them, you know, from our own perspectives, not from the perspective of the uh, the person we interviewed or the company that we interviewed. So yeah, I really enjoy being on like this side because you're the hosting and I, I feel so yeah. relaxed. Whereas like <laughs> anytime I'm hosting, man, I, I have like my list of things that I want to cover. And then I'm on, like, I'm constantly, uh, and for the audience that's not, like, aware, um, I probably you guys won't be aware, so you're getting a little sneak peek here. Um, so we interviewed Jordan Harbinger as part of, like, uh, one of the episodes that's coming out in, in 2022. And one of the things he, like, in that episode, he coached me a lot on, like, how to actually be a better podcast host. And so now I've been, like, really conscious of a lot of the things and a lot of things that I do. Um, and it's just like, oh, man, like, there's so many things as a host you got to be trying to like manage uh, and kind of think through while you're trying to also make sure you're listening to the guest, which is not as easy as it sounds. But but yeah, let's yeah. Uh, let's get into it. I, was, I just wanted to let the audience know how much how relaxed I feel right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, starting with uh, the first episode for the 2021 season, it was. The amazing Gerard Huck talking to us about the Lakers and the branding of the Lakers, Los Angeles Lakers. And uh, the main key takeaway we had from that was, one, attracting talented people 
starts with culture from the top down, and two, be the hero in your own story. I'll start by just asking you the question, what did what do those key takeaways mean to you back then, and what do they mean to you right now? <laughs> um, th- this episode was interesting. This is, uh, if you guys notice our like podcast trajectory, like our first up until episode, uh, it looks like episode number 18, 17 or 18, we were just doing our friends and people that we know, and Gerard was one of them. And uh, I remember one of the funniest things about this episode was like, I wasn't expecting Gerard to actually do such a good job. <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember, like, we had like pretty low expectations for Gerard. We're like, oh, man. Yeah. So, so for some context, it's not that we don't think Gerard is uh, knowledgeable or talented, but he's he's a medical, he's, right now he's a resident, right? So at the time he was a medical school student. And so like, we were like, okay, he's probably going to, we're going to have to do the heavy lifting in this episode, but he actually did yeah. um, a fantastic job. And your yeah. question about the key takeaways, uh, I think at the time, I don't know that my understandings changed, but one thing that I will add some color on those is like, we're both involved with Falcon Notes, right? And one of the things that is surprising to me is that like, we actually have a team that I would consider like, sometimes I think like, dude, why are these people here, <laughs> right? Like, why yeah. why do they choose to spend their free time working on with us, right? And, and I feel yeah. extremely grateful and blessed that like, um, you know, these people are taking their time and, and they're uh, believing in our vision. And uh, what that reminds me of is how much of a responsibility that we have, right, as, as leaders of Falcon Notes to actually create that culture and make sure that we don't lose those people, right? Like, yeah, they, they're trusting us, but now it's up to us to make sure that um, we are looking out for their best interests and doing what's best for them and, cr- and setting them up for success in whatever uh, aspect it may be. And that's kind of what's been going through my mind. Um, I remember in this episode, he talked about the the bus family, right? Was it was it the bus family? Uh, the the general manager. Yeah. Her her family. Yeah. Yeah, and, and kind of how they. I, I can't remember the name. Yeah, I think it was the bus but, family, but um, and how they kind of created this culture at the Lakers where players want to be right, and so. Uh, yeah. This is an episode that you were a part of too. So, what are your thoughts? On, yeah. On this one. Yeah, uh, now that you you kind of jogged my memory a little bit with that, I remember it had to do with the organizational culture, not just the team leadership culture, like from, uh, you know, head coach, main coach, assistant coach, stuff like that. I think it was more of a organization and general manager perspective and ownership perspective of the Lakers. So, like, it goes way above the main aspect of the brand or the main aspect of the team. It's like the people that the buck stops at, so to speak, you know, the quote, or the saying buck stops here type of thing, right. like the top top management, uh, it starts all the way up there, not just like at some at, at the main uh, attraction or what people see. Uh, it actually starts from behind the scenes. So I thought that was very interesting as well. So we're going to go ahead and skip some of our shorts and come back to them later, depending on time. Uh, but we'll go ahead with uh, the next uh, main episode that we had. It was branding an international nonprofit with uh, University of Michigan alumni. Omar Elias, where we well, learned about the Michigan on. difference. Why, why did you feel it was important <laughs> to bring up a University of Michigan alum? Because <laughs> we talked about it in the episode. We talked about what the Michigan difference is. I forgot what it was, but it was something like, you know, you, you, you get like free free support from like the, the, the university itself or something. No, no. Uh, but I thought it was. <laughs> so I think you made that joke on the podcast and you were saying that because yeah. uh, he was talking about he felt this pressure to do something right and so, oh yeah and yeah you're like see that's the michigan difference i was like bro why did you say that like you need to chill out <laughs> with your michigan propaganda i'm not even from university of michigan by the way but for the audience that's but why anyways, it's worse yeah, so this episode <laughs> yeah i know this episode is <laughs> we're talking about branding so their branding worked <laughs> um but uh yeah this episode didn't have any key key takeaways so we're gonna have to wing this one this was a two-part episode, and it was jam-packed with so many things, and I feel like that's one of the reasons we didn't have key takeaways. But what do you feel like 
you know, reflecting on the episode now was the key takeaway from did, from him. Did we just what? Okay, that's interesting. We didn't have key takeaways. That that caught me by at least on this podcast description. Oh yeah, I just got these from the podcast description, like the little little explanations that we have. Mm, I, I think we probably did that uh, because I was trying to save time, uh, and I got lazy yeah. at the end. <laughs> Right, yeah. um, and it, and it was super long as well, so that's probably why. But what I remember, I think some, some things uh, that come to mind from this episode are uh, just the importance of vetting your the people you work with, uh, and making sure that you take time to really understand whether the person, especially like if you're working with offshore people, people that are not with you, like you take the time to do your research and uh, yeah. vet out whether they're actually, their resume actually lines up with what they're able to do. But one of the things that I remember right off the back while you were mentioning is that Omar Elias, I remember he, uh, he, he had this amazing idea where he had this blog for his company that he would use to provide value to his supporters. Mm -hmm. So people wanted to help in certain ways. He couldn't find a way for them to directly help his project. But he basically said, well, you're interested in this idea of building wells. See if you can write our blog and provide content for us through that. And then we can hook you up with, you know, any references that you might need. Right, um, right, right. So I thought that was a very interesting approach, especially from a non perspective. You don't have the finances to, you know, bring on uh, a blogger or a writer or a copywriter or whatever. But he was like, hey, these people want to help. Let's see how we can help them. And he found a way to give them uh, you know, a job and also provide value from his company. And his blog is probably one of the coolest parts of his nonprofit because, you know, how many nonprofits have a blog? I don't know. But that was the one, that was where people like, you know, posted about the LeBron well, LeBron James well, and, and the controversy around that. So I thought that was definitely very interesting. That, that reminds me, like, uh, if anyone that's listening wants to be a part of the Branding Deep Dive team, uh, we can set up a similar situation where you guys can write a blog and not get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> Convert our episodes into written form. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, one, so I think what I remember is in this episode, one thing that was interesting is the discussion around like the temptation to take shortcuts when it comes to building your brand. If you remember mm -hmm. like, uh, one of the discussion points that came up was like how easy it is nowadays to kind of fake your way to a big following. And by the way, can we talk about the branding deep dive effect a little bit? Are we allowed to do that? What was that? Dude, like what is the branding we can go effect? through all these episodes and like everyone made it big in some form or another after they'd been on branding deep dive. Oh, really? <laughs> the Kyrie, <laughs> I been Kyrie thing. So after uh, Omar Elias came on branding deep dive, Kyrie Irving made a donation to Pani. Oh yeah. And that was like huge in, uh, in like, it was all over the like ESPN, Bleacher Report, all this stuff. Right. And I was like, I was yeah. just I was like, Hey man, like you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But, um, and then, uh, if you remember Gerard, when he came on, so Gerard, like, I think it was a couple of weeks ago where he posted, like he was like resident of the month at like uh, oh, yeah. Henry Ford or whatever. And I, I like did my story, <laughs> I like, uh, I shared it in my story and I was like, uh, Gerard wins resident of the month after he was on Branding Deep Dive. Coincidence? <laughs> Didn't think so. <laughs> yeah. And then, there you go. and then like talking about launch good, right? This, this campaign that just happened with like, uh, like Gigi Hadid and all these like other celebrities after Branding Deep Dive episode BDD. came out. <laughs> Dang, we're gonna follow this trend. Yes, yeah. capitalize on it. No, but yeah, you were talking about um, you know taking no shortcuts. Can you elaborate on that real quick? Oh yeah, so like uh, nowadays, it's really easy to uh, you know fake your way to making it look like you have those signposts that come with actually building a brand, um, but that can never replace uh, internally the feeling you get when you actually get like, so for example, when they got the grant from Michigan, right. And they got that $25,000 yeah. check. And then now they're able to sign off, add to their website. Hey, we're signed off by like university of Michigan president, or whatever, right? Like those things, when they're real internally, it gives you a lot more confidence because now it's like, I worked for this and I'm getting a little bit of, um, you know, like people are starting to 
understand and support and that kind of thing. Whereas like, if you fake it, like, you know, you can, you can buy followers, you can do all that stuff. But at the end, on the, at the end of the day, you know, you faked it. You know I mean? yeah. And people can tell it. Yeah, well. yeah. But yeah, I remember he, he was saying that that gave him so much confidence in what he was doing. Right. Um, so small wins like that, if they're authentic, they really help out in terms of the morale of the organization. Exactly. Yep. So the uh, next episode we had was on the Audi RS6. Now, I'm not going to lie. This episode, I was kind of like, why are we doing this? Uh, you know, I, I don't, I feel like, you know, this is not a good story that we want, but one of the things that really made me change my opinion, even before we started recording was this concept that you said it was a key. I, I feel like this key takeaway you had written down before we interviewed Ahmed Adim, but this, the key takeaway is the story that matters the most is the story that your customers are telling, willing to, are telling each other. Mm. Now, I didn't realize how important that was when, until we started doing the research into the RSX and talking about it with Ahmed Adim. And the other key takeaway is branding is about creating positive connections uh, with your target audience. So yeah, it looks like we take kinda, away with the first one. Yeah, I was going to say in the second one, it looks like we kind of mailed that in. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the most uh, basic key takeaway. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I think the, uh, the first one is the one, yeah, that, that's kind of like what sparked the whole uh, discussion. Um, well, so, so for some background, I think we talked about it in the episode, but Really, like what happened is me and Ahmed Adim, we were watching the Hummer ad together and we were just talking about how, how much we disliked it. And he was like, hey, you want to see a really well done ad? Check this out. Right. And so he shared that ad with me organically. And then I was like, yeah, that is a good ad. Like, I was like, man, there's like no words in it. Yet now I, I kind of want this car, even though I find the shape of the car hideous. I don't actually like the yeah. car. Right. But like, like the station wagon. Yeah. I don't like station wagons. Right. Like that's not yeah. something that I'm into. Um, but just the ad is like, it got me really excited about it. And it, 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 you know, touches on a lot of different things that we can talk about. It talks about heritage and all this stuff, right. Like family, blah, blah, blah. But what was really interesting in doing the research for this was that every single person that's reviewing the car was saying the same thing. And mm -hmm. that was, this is like the best everyday driver you can get. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was like, what the heck is an everyday driver? Did, did Audi pay these people to say that? Right. Like, how are they getting every single person that's reviewing this car to say the same exact thing? Right. Yeah. That's And they were not related with Audi at all. Exactly. They're just like independent reviewers on YouTube or something. Literally. Yeah. Just like independent people on YouTube. And they're all saying the same exact thing. And then like a lot of the other people, they're not like Audi fanatics. Right. They're just like they're car yeah. guys in general. And, and they're all saying the same thing. It was like, OK, how did they craft this narrative? where everyone is saying the same thing. And, and that's kind of like, uh, we should probably do like another deep dive on like how to actually create a campaign that does that because we could definitely use that for like some of the things we're doing, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do people say when they're, when they hear branding deep dive and they're talking about branding deep dive uh, with other people, right? Like what are, they, what are people yeah. saying like about Falcon Notes when we're not there, Yeah, right? Like that's the kind of thing that like, the people that are really good at branding and messaging and communicating, like they're able to work yeah. backwards and figure out how to, how to, how to communicate that and get that feeling across. And that's where the magic yeah. happens. But yeah. What are, what yeah. are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, no, I agree. And I think like when I, when, when I think about this episode in the context of the one I most recently listened to with launch good, you know, launch good is a story where the target audience was telling a different story. Hold on, hold on. Oh, are you going to pause me? Uh, yeah, I just want to, for the audience that's listening on audio, I, I did want to mention <laughs> that Aldo Manana is wearing a launch good uh, hoodie right now. And he's like, yeah. I feel like he's like sitting up higher just so we can see the launch good logo. So Aldo Manana, yeah. I, I did want to mention that I, I see your launch good shirt. Um, thank you. No, because <laughs> what it is, is if I lean in, I'd have to kind of lift the camera up a little bit and then the light comes. So I'm just like... Mm going back a little bit right. but anyways yes <laughs> one of the benefits is you can see the launch look. <laughs> but anyways yeah so you know, what's interesting in launch's case is that the the audience had a different story that they were telling than what the founders wanted to tell and then they pivoted and then it's interesting to i would love to have some marketing people from audi rs6's commercial or you know their marketing team to come in on the episode on the on branding deep dive and discuss how it was that they were able to do this if they are aware of it and, you know, one, if they were aware of it and two, how were they able to do it? Was it conscious, unconscious and stuff like that? So um, that would definitely be a good follow-up. 
That's a really good point because, I mean, Audi's been around for like what, like a lot of, uh, I don't want to say the exact number, but I think it's probably at least like 50, 60, maybe 100 years, right? And so yeah. Launchgood is a company that's like pretty recent and you brought up that they pivoted and they shifted kind of their messaging after they realized that their audience wants something else from them. And so maybe it is something right. that stems from the audience and, yeah. and you just have to listen to your audience and what they find about it and then, you know, double down on that. And the next episode is one of my favorites, honestly. Uh, I don't know if it was two part, I think it was one part, but we went pretty long. Gymshark with our guest, Rafi Husseini. Um, is one of your favorites? But yeah, I, I really like this episode, particularly no because I like the founder a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not as much the guest as it was the, the company that we're looking into, Gymshark. Gymshark, uh, you know, uh, athleisure company that broke into a pretty saturated market. But we had two takeaways and I added a third one now, but we'll talk about it. One was the focus on customer service. If you remember the story from Gymshark, I'll let you expound on that. And two was take feedback from the influencers you are working with. Hmm. Yeah, um, just kind of expound on both of those. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm sure there's numerous examples, but the example that Ruffy shared was, I think they ran a Black Friday sale and within like an hour or something, the website crashed because they had so many orders. Um, and so a lot of people wrote in complaining that, hey, we weren't able to order. And so he like hand wrote a bunch of notes to like everyone that wasn't able to order and gave them like a discount. Um, and just like the lesson from that is like, you know, a CEO at that level, taking the time out to hand write notes to like thousands of people, um, right? Like that really, that speaks more than any like social media post that you can get about, you know, customer service or anything like that. That's what customer service is all about. Um, and then for the other thing, the, the influencers, uh, early on, Ben Francis was working. He, I think Gymshark is really one of the companies that pioneered influencer marketing, right? Like they started yeah. with these uh, people that were kind of big on YouTube at the time. Even like YouTube at the time is not really like a place where quote unquote influencers are like, they're not getting paid out like they are today and stuff like that. And so there's some people yeah. posting uh, bodybuilding videos and stuff like that, that they reached out, sent them some of their product. They'd be like, Hey, check this out. What do you think? And then they gave some feedback and they made changes to their product because of that. And then as a result, yeah, you know, the lesson here for the audience is like, Hey, if you're working with people that have distribution, right? Like when we're talking about distribution, we're talking about people that have an audience, right? If you're working with someone that has an audience, even if it's not someone with an audience, you should, this is a general principle, but like even more important, when you have someone with an audience, you need to make sure you're listening to them and applying their feedback to the product so that they feel more bought into the product, right? And they feel yeah. like they had a, a part in creating this product. And then the way they push that will be 10 times more organic than if you just pay them to do it, right? So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and you said it was one of your favorite episodes. And, you, and what was the third takeaway yeah. that you added on? And the reason why it was one of my favorites is just reflecting on this third takeaway, which was if you know the story of Ben Francis, he actually left the CEO position to take on an inferior role position and gave the CEO position to someone else, right? And honestly, the reason why I was thinking about this was I started watching Silicon Valley. And if, for those of you guys who've watched the TV show, the main character, I forget his name, is uh, it was not a very likable Richard. character at all, but Pied Piper was, yeah, Richard. Pied Piper was his company. Richard was so desperately wanted to be the CEO of the company. And he was making some mistakes that, um, you know, ultimately he was a programmer. He was, he was like a code writer and he was not built out to be the leader that he needed to be for his company, Pied Piper, but he wouldn't let go of the role and give it to someone else. And I reflected on Ben Francis doing that. And I was like, wow, it's actually such a big thing that he was able to be self-aware in that context and be able to pass that role on in order for the company to keep growing at, at the pace that it was and it, at the pace that it needed to be. So I was like, there's a huge lesson in there. And if people can like bring their egos down a little bit as CEOs and if, if they need to, and then, you know, execute on that, like seeing like, Hey, this guy's better at doing this than I am. Right. Richard, the guy, he, he was like, he, he could barely give a pep talk to his, his team. Right. <laughs> but then a CEO needs to be able to do that. You know, he just wanted to go code. He just wanted to, you know, the, the compression algorithm, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so he, they needed someone new. And so he wasn't able to deliver on that. So I think like, that is an important lesson that we see from the story of Gymshark. And 
I'm just blown away by um, Ben Francis' foresight to be able to do that uh, and take on a different role where he's more valuable. So that's why that's why it makes this episode my favorite. <laughs> yeah, and that's a that's a really good lesson. Uh, the ego piece, right? Like being humble enough to know that this may not be your strength. And I think what's powerful in Ben Francis's case is that like he's a really young guy, right? And to be mm-hmm. humble when you're running a company and you've had success is, I think. It's, it's easy for us to say sitting down here, but like literally he's, he's built this company from the ground up. And if you watch Silicon right. Valley, like that's how, you know, this is something, it's your baby, right? And you feel like, mm-hmm. um, you know, you should be running it. You should be making all the decisions. Uh, whereas sometimes yeah. it's, maybe it's best that someone else that has experienced scaling and all this other stuff comes in and helps you out, right? And then the other thing from that is like, he was able to focus on what he actually liked about the business. I think if I remember one of his interviews correctly, it was like, he he felt like um not only that like he wasn't doing a good enough job but that he he didn't enjoy the job right and then he enjoyed Mm -hmm. doing the branding and like you know marketing piece and so he's like let me let me focus on this which is ultimately what something what i want to do with falconos is like hey let me bring in some people that can do all the things that i don't like i'll just do what i like right but but yeah Yeah. it's a good takeaway there Singer, vehicle design, I was there for this one with our guest, Yasser Mushtaq, repeat guest, where we talk about the com- brand company Singer and uh, the resto mods that they do for Porsche uh, 911s from a specific year. And uh, I, lo- I love these two takeaways. I don't know if you have them pulled up. <laughs> Find your niche to charge a premium. And I love it because it's short, sweet, and like that's all we got from these guys because they definitely did what these two key takeaways are, which is they found a niche, very specific Porsche model, resto mod, and they charged a hell of a premium for their price. Um, and they were able to stay alive as a company doing this. Um, I don't know if there's much to add uh, to this. Honestly. You know what? As, as I'm reading this, I realized the reason why they're so short is because in the actual writing, I wanted to just be like a quick little blurb. I don't want to expound mm. too much. Whereas like in the episode, you actually kind of, we go in. Right, right, right. So it's not that we're mailing it in, maybe part <laughs> of it, but um, it's it's more of like, hey, we don't want to give away everything in this little little. Piece. That's true. Um, I think one thing that's not related, I think this was one of our best episodes in terms of uh, teachable content, right? Like lessons and like really just mm-hmm. diving into like things that, examples, stories that like, uh, it was a little bit repetitive, but I think it was, I remember Yasser after, as like kind of like an insult, he was like, hey man, this was like that one Asian guy. I was like, you're talking about Chris Doe? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I was like, dude, that's not an insult. That's a compliment. <laughs> that's exactly what we're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was he trying to say though? <laughs> so I think Yasser is more of a fan of like the Joe Rogan type podcast where it's just like super conversational and you know, like, of yeah, course, yeah. Oh, there yeah, are yeah. nuggets and stuff like that. But uh, whereas, like, Chris Doze is more, like, always trying to bring it back to some lesson. Right? right, that was, right, right. That's kind of our purpose, too. Like, we, we want to be an educational podcast, not an entertainment podcast. Of course, we have to be, like, engaging. But there's a – I think there's a difference between engagement and entertainment, right? Like, I, I wouldn't consider yeah. myself an entertainer. Uh, but you mm-hmm. do have to have a certain level of skill to make sure that the audience – you're managing the energy and stuff like that, so it's not boring yeah. the whole time. Something we're still working on. Yeah, yeah. Let's go yeah. To the next one. ALM, uh, the first Muslim fraternity, uh, Alif Lam Mim, also known as Alpha Lambda Mu. Here you had three guests on and no co-hosts, so this was definitely a challenge for you, probably. Shahir Ali, Hamad Fazlani, Bilal Ayub from, I think, I guess they're from Dallas, Texas community. Uh, the takeaway one: people join people, not organizations which was an excellent takeaway, which I'll get into right now. But the other one was listen to your customers and see why they are joining you. Mm -hmm. There often is a disconnect between what the founders or marketing team thinks uh, is the reality of why they're joining and what is actually the reason for people joining. And this is crazy. What are your thoughts on those? This is crazy because like we, we brought that up in the earlier when we were talking about launch kid and what, Mm -hmm. and uh, what was the other thing we're talking about? Um, Jim Shark, uh, Omar Elias, Adi, Audi, and uh, Launchkit, right? And so, yeah, yeah. 
Lobscode had this takeaway as well, but it was worded different. Um, and and where the, in Launchcode's case, it was like, hey, your vision can change and, and all this, but it's really it's the same thing. It's just like, hey, you start with a certain idea and it's not always what your audience wants or needs from you. And I think this has been one thing that's been like, if, if we're talking about 2021 in review, like super eye-opening for me is like, hey, we, we are stubborn people we are people that have certain idea uh, and and a vision of what we want to do, right? Like I could tell you exactly uh -huh. where I would see branding deep dive in five years, ten years, what I what I want from it, and all this stuff. But the reality is, like, hey, the people that are listening may not want that from me, right? And it's uh -huh. it's important to listen to them, get that feedback, and of course, the people yeah. join people, not organizations. I think that's uh, you don't really need to expound much on that. That's pretty self explanatory. But I mean, I think. The craziest thing about this is that this is, you know, pre TikTok, this, this organization. And uh, it's just interesting to see the influence of culture, right? I feel like now more than ever, people don't trust big organizations and companies as much as they do people now, which is why this whole influencer thing is happening where you, you, you trust people, you trust people that you know, um, more so than companies that you don't know or faces that you don't know. And I think that is going to become a big trend moving forward with brands. You know, we were talking about, you know, just with Falcon Notes, it's like, well, the Manan, look, we have a product MDM. Um, you got to be the guy kind of providing that, you know, providing the, the the value from that product. And why is that is because people will trust me more than they trust a faceless Instagram, uh, you know, page, for example. Uh, so I think I think it's a very insightful key takeaway. And um, if you are thinking about starting a company, oftentimes we might be too shy or we might not have like the you know, person persona for being the people that, you know, people want to follow, but it's going to become very important for any company, any organization. Yeah. Just to touch on that. Uh, we, I think in one of the upcoming episodes, we, we have a little bit of a discussion on like brand archetypes and humanizing, oh, yeah. uh, humanizing a brand. Right. And all this comes from yeah. right the, you know, the whole concept of brand archetypes, you know, a lot of times these are just buzzwords that a lot of people drop, but like really at the end of the day, what people are trying to do is create a more human experience for uh, for the brand, so that when you associate with the brand, you feel like some kind of human connection, right? And, and always human yeah. connection trumps whatever like organization. But if you can make an organization feel inorganic, yeah, yeah, right. Like so, that's where kind of the brand archetype discussions come in. Check that out sometime in twenty two. <laughs> Next episode: web content management with Atik Warich. Key takeaway here, take the time to invest in content creation and content management. Uh, and then the other one, there's a three-step formula to this process. One, understand analytics to see what the problems customers are facing. Two, build a solutions for that. And three, get feedback on those solutions to see if they're working or not. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so for the second one, it's um, the three-step formula was actually for creating a useful product or website, uh, not for the content creation piece. So the first, oh, okay. the first one, uh, what I'll just kind I of listen to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> so the, yeah, the first one, uh, for small businesses, I think a lot of times people may underestimate the power of, uh, creating content in this episode, we kind of touch on SEO and ranking on Google, not too much, but, uh, what's really interesting is how many, how much traffic the department energy.gov is getting just from like simple questions like how long do I keep my turkey in the oven, right? Like those are real questions people are asking. They're getting thousands, sorry about that, thousands upon thousands of hits for people coming to the website from that. And so uh, really like you, as a business, again, your key purpose is to provide some sort of value for your customers, right? And make their lives easier, make their lives better in some way. And you need to be able to communicate that uh, and have content that serves them in in that need, right? And, and it's super important. Uh, I think, you know, Gary Vee has his thesis or one of the things he always says is like, every company nowadays is a media company if you want to compete, yeah. right? And so yeah. that's kind of like the, the idea there. The second thing, like I'll just I'll bring the example that he used, um, and it's it's really you see this like at Walmart, Meyer, like at the end of your shopping 
experience. You have like, you know, you, you finish, you swipe the card and then like on the screen, it'll pop up like, hey, did you find everything you were looking for? Yes, no, boom, you hit yes or you hit no. And then like, uh, you know, they take that feedback and they move on. Most people are willing to answer. I don't think I've ever hit no. <laughs> I mean, have you ever had a time where? Yeah, many times. <laughs> why, why, why? But, uh, by, by the time I get to the checkout, I'm like, screw it. I, I don't have time to like go back and look for it anymore. So it's like, why are you even asking me this question? <laughs> At this point, like, if there was someone who walked up to me in the aisle and said, hey, you know, did you find everything you're looking for? I'd be like, oh, no, actually, you know, I, <laughs> I need to find this thing. I haven't been able to find it. I, I think you're an anomaly here. But, like, or maybe that's why, like, the, the store is not fixing their layout is because they're getting false feedback from their, their customers that yeah. you know, they can find everything yeah. they need. But um, most people are willing to answer, like, one question, right? Like, most if it's, like, one yeah, question. Yeah. But if it's, like, a 15-page long survey, people get kind of, like, turned off. Right. And that's why mm -hmm. a lot of companies have this uh, to get feedback on like their management and stuff. Right. So to get feedback on your direct manager, they'll just ask like a one question every day. Right. And so most people are willing yeah. to answer that honestly and stuff like that. And so yeah. the lesson here was like, if you have a website, you have a product, you have a tool, create some form of feedback like that, where that you're, you can get your customers feedback instantly. And it's not too much effort for them. If someone's had a yeah. bad experience, Usually they're willing to go through no and explain what's wrong with it because they actually care enough to tell you no. If someone had a good yeah. experience, now you know, hey, they found what they're looking for. So the example yeah. they gave is like, look, if you created an article about whatever, at the bottom of the page, just add a little thing. Hey, did you did you answer the question? Did the question that you were searching for get answered? Or did you find what you were looking yeah, for? Yeah, yeah. Right? And that, right. that like is- Like the frequently asked questions pages. Right, exactly. And it's like- the, yeah. the reason why is because if you look at Google Analytics and a lot of these analytic tools that are out there, there's actually not a way to measure to see whether or not the customer got what they were looking for, right? You can mm -hmm. see how many times they came on your site. You can see the bounce rate. You can see if they left and all this stuff. But like, did they get what they're looking for? You don't know, right? Like there's not, yeah. a lot of times they're not making a purchase. They're just going to your site to see how long they should warm the turkey up for, right? And so yeah. uh, that's just one, it, one thing that I found really pretty cool. Yeah. You know what's interesting? I guess I've always said no to those, even when I'm Googling something, like I have a problem with my MacBook, and Apple is notorious for this. They'll be like, you know, on their forums, they'll be like, did you find the answer you were looking for? And I would never fill it out, because I guess I was like skeptical of whether or not they would use my feedback or not, but it was just, it's interesting. Same situation with Walmart, where they asked me, did I find it, what I was looking for? Uh, but I guess in that case, I thought they were going to give me directions to go find it, but now that I think about it, they just... <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to go back. <laughs> but now that I think about it, it makes more sense for them to just use it as a statistic. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's a good point. That's a great point, actually. Yeah. You thought someone was going to come oh. up and show you how to get to it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Anyways, all right. So chugging along here. I love this episode, too. Uh, you know, this was a really long one, Mechanic 1. <clears throat> Yeah, this was when With you were buddy, totally inconsiderate of, of Zar's time, and you just kept asking him questions. We had so many, so for, for the audience, if you haven't listened to this episode, we started with insider information from one of his ex-employees, right? If that's not juicy enough for you already, it's like, well, what do you want, what do you want more from the podcast, right? But one of his ex-employees had some issues with the way that he was running his company, and so we had all these questions from this. We interviewed this ex-employee, and we told Zar, we're like, hey, we're interviewing this ex-employee. Are you okay with answering questions that we might have from this uh, interview that we have with this ex-employee? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I had a bunch of questions. I guess that's one of the reasons we went along. And, you know, he's comfortable answering the questions. So I thought we might as well milk the situation. But um, one of the key takeaways we had was you don't need permission from anyone to provide value to the world. Uh, number two, don't be afraid to ask people for reviews. Mm. Number three, and I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, Ahmed Chima has asked you to write a review for BDD. <laughs> hey, so uh, number, real number. quick, I just want to mention one story. So there's this one guy, I asked him for a review, and I, I'm like 90% sure he doesn't listen to the podcast, so I'm not worried. Uh, but he was like, I'm not going to say his involvement because it might give away who it was. So I asked this guy for a review on the podcast, like, I think the date was like November 1st. Right. And he's like, sure, just remind me tomorrow. I'm like, okay, fine. Like, if he wants me to remind me tomorrow, like, I'll, I'll remind him tomorrow. I remind him tomorrow. The guy just like leaves me on red. And so, for every, like, every other day for uh, almost 25 days, I reminded him 
And like, at, like at one point he's just like, what are you reminding me about again? And I was like, dude, can you reiterate? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I got to finally, after like uh, three weeks of trying, I, I got him to write a review. And then the guy was like, Hey, when I start my like YouTube channel, can you, uh, you know, subscribe and, and comment and stuff and support? I was like, yeah, after you follow up for three weeks, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> nice. I was going to say, were you talking about me? But because it took me a while to write. Oh, yeah, YouTube, you were the worst. Like, like this guy either. was a co host of the freaking podcast. And I literally asked you, like, I, I don't know how many times I've asked you. But... I actually, so every time you asked, I actually tried to write a podcast, re- like the review on Apple Podcasts. But you know, obviously the interface sucks from your phone. So, like, I, I wasn't able to do it. And then eventually I was able to do it. So I actually have an excuse. Like, I legit tried every single time you asked. So, by the way, for, but... for the people that are listening, uh, Apple podcast reviews are super helpful and I really appreciate everyone that leaves a review uh, for everyone that's already left one. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you haven't, and you have an iPhone or you have a MacBook or whatever, uh, and you enjoy and you get value out of this podcast, please do leave a review. It really helps the podcast out a lot. Also for people that listen on Spotify, Spotify has just released the option to leave a review of the podcast, uh, not a review. It's just a rating. So, there's actually no, you can't write like written words or whatever, but just you can do the stars. So if you listen on Spotify, the condition is Spotify doesn't actually let you leave the review unless you actually have played an episode. So mm. don't try to like go in and scam Spotify. Uh, but if you if you listen on Spotify, would also appreciate a review on there. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, but yeah, let's let's get back into this one. But yeah, mechanic one, uh, you don't need permission from anyone to provide value to the world. Don't be afraid to ask people for reviews. Number three, people are willing to pay for good services. And number four, effective advertising is about reaching your target audience where they are. Yeah, so I think all four of those are like great and we can dive into them. But I think for the sake of time, the one that I what I was most surprised about, I'll say, was that number four piece. And what shocked me about that story is how much money he spends on direct mail advertising. Like th- mm-hmm. me, I- I'm coming from like the digital era. I thought direct mail was dead. I legit, mm-hmm. I was like, you know, for Falcon Notes, for example, I would never consider direct mail advertising. Like that wasn't even no. a, a thing that came up as like, hey, d- d- did we want to do direct? Like, you know what I mean? Like we yeah. considered a lot of things, <laughs> but like yeah. direct mail was never one of them. It was like, you yeah. might as well ask me if I want to buy a billboard, right? Like, no, like, yeah. are, you, are you kidding? Like, what am I going to do with a billboard? Yeah. Right? So it, it was surprising because it's just as effective as maybe if he spent more time on social media, uh, but it, it may actually be arguably more effective for him because he knows exactly who he's targeting and he knows how mm-hmm. to speak to them. And at the end of the yeah. day, that's what matters in marketing, not the medium you use, but like understanding, hey, I'm talking to Abdul Manan and this is the way you need to speak to Abdul Manan if you want him to do business with you, right? And so Which that, medium is effective in communicating with your audience. Yeah, exactly. So Abdul Manan is someone yeah, that checks his dope. email or whatever, right? Like, so Abdul Manan, I might want to yeah. use email for him, right? Maybe Instagram, he's not checking or whatever, right? So it's yeah. uh, it's something to think through yeah. based on the business you're in. What about you? This is, I, uh, I uh, between, I think I already told you this, but like, I think out of like all your performances hosting, I think this was your best one. And it was also your final up until this point, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I, I enjoyed this episode a lot. I think um, the other thing people are willing to pay for good service. What I loved about Zara was that everyone's experience with him for the most part was he's just so good at explaining what the heck is going on with my car. Right. And he the education component is very important, especially if you provide, you know, a, a, you know, a complex service that might not be uh, might not be something that, you're, that your client is familiar with. You know, this is a drop off service where like they drop off their car, they expect it to be fixed and come back. Um, Zara was able to tell them what was going on, what they did, and how it should improve their car. Um, so I thought that piece was really good, especially if you provide a service that is a little bit more complex. So shout out to Zara for that. Yeah, and, and it's also like he's in a space where most people don't bother doing that, right? And that's what mm-hmm. makes it. Oh yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. it's a big differentiator from the service of other people because most yep. mechanics you go to, they're not taking time to explain it to you because you, you know, like. He, I mean, I, in my experience, like you go in, you feel like, oh, like the, the mechanic feels like he knows 10 times more than me. And, and yeah, he does yeah, yeah. in terms of cars, but like, there's no reason why I need to feel like that. 
right? And yeah, that's that's the exactly. thing about Czar is like he personalizes the experience. So like you feel like, oh, okay, like I don't know anything he's saying, but like yeah, it sounds good. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> explaining it to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, next episode, Adam Sink online presence. Adam Sink number one, be on our platform. And number two, SEO strategy starts with figuring out what people are searching for to find your competitors. People aren't searching for, people are searching for answers to their problems. They're not searching for you specifically. I, I love that. Um, tell us more. Yeah, so the, the first thing that I learned from this episode that I didn't already know, uh, and, and I actually, although we've had this discussion before, is like, I've always been like, hey, in terms of social media, let's only create a platform that we know we can commit to. Right. But one, yeah. one thing that Adam brought up is like, hey, even if you're not active on the platform, it's good to have presence on every single social media platform with the same like information. Right. Like, for example, Branding Deep Dive, there's a podcast where you do X, Y, Z and it links to your website. And so mm -hmm. what he mentioned is that, like, essentially, Google has like, you know, tons of ranking factors that they use to rank your website in search results. And. Uh -huh. uh, w like one of the heaviest ranking factors that there are, are, is your presence on these social media sites. So if you're on Facebook, Instagram, uh -huh. Twitter, all with the same information, even if you're not heavily active on them, Google still gives more weight to your, uh, your website's results and search because you're, it shows them that you're a legit business, right? Because yeah. at the end of the day, that's what they're trying to figure out is like, who's legit, who's not. And then they're one of yeah. the results that are legit. And then the second one. Yeah was, uh, and this is a mistake that we made, right, with Falcon Notes is that, like, people don't care what we do, right? Like, people are not searching the web, like, hey, what is Falcon Notes doing? Or what is Branding Game yeah. doing? <laughs> They're looking for answers to their own problems, right? Yeah. And so when they come to your website, the, all the messaging, all the communication, the blog posts, and how you describe your services, all that stuff, should be based on what people are searching, right? Yeah. What is a problem that you solve, right? That's a key insight, totally, yeah. yeah. Right, like, like so, no one cares that, if so, like, for example, right now, if you go on Falconos website, it says, I'm a <laughs> <you're> <laughs> right now, right? It says, like, we design journals with purpose, right? But, like, if I'm someone that doesn't know what Falcon Notes is or anything like that, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know the Manon, like, I'm still confused. Like, yeah. What the heck is this? Right. Like, yeah. And how do they solve any problem that I have? Right. Yeah. And so that's something that we are going to revamp in the next couple of days and you'll see it when it comes out. Yeah. Like what, what we're thinking through is really like, how do we communicate to the person that comes on the site, what we do that helps. Them. Yeah. And optimizing SEO strategy based on that yep. because they're searching, they're not searching a solution. They're searching a problem. So for example, if, if the goal was to have someone search and get the answer BDD, what is the question they're going to be asking? It'll be like podcasts on brand strategy and design yeah. uh, for small businesses or whatever, right? So that's how you want to be able to think when you're optimizing your SEO strategy. I thought that was like amazing. I was like, wow, that's a good way to start getting into your clients' heads and uh, reverse engineering, so to speak. Um, next episode, board games with Meyer Huck. Um, key takeaway here, number one, think about how you can create an organic, memorable experience. Board game creators have reverse engineered how to give their customers unique, memorable, fun experiences every time they play. This is the recipe for uh, word of mouth marketing. And number two, people buy into brands that they feel reflect their personality. I was not able to listen to this episode, so brief me on this. Come on, man. Um, <laughs> so well, this episode was a fun one. This is uh, essentially to give you a little bit of context. Mahir had gotten his hands like one of his friends created a new board game called uh, Machine 8. And so we got to talking, uh, and originally we were just going to talk about Machine 8, but then we, like the more we talked, we we're like, oh, we should actually do on like how board games kind of during the pandemic, we saw a big uh, surge in board games again, right? And so mm -hmm. what's behind that? Uh, what's, you know, going on here and all that stuff. And one of the, the key things, this is, I did this episode while I was taking the brand strategy course with Prof G. Mm -hmm. And I know like you guys make the joke that I keep talking about like uh, uh, pre-purchase, purchase, post-purchase, post -purchase, like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, like I started using a lot of that terminology, right? But one thing that's interesting is that like uh, a lot of brands that we see 
are, uh, you know, tr like historically, the the process that has worked is you focus on pre-purchase, right? Like if I have a bottle of peanut butter, I design a nice label around it, and then I have a tagline, and then I add commercials on TV, and then people now want it, right? It's as simple as that, right? That's how you build your brand. Now, the problem right. is nowadays that's not as effective anymore, right? Like, nah, like who watches commercials anymore, right? Like most people have ad blocker on uh, or like YouTube premium. I, I mean, I don't even have like cable TV anymore. So I don't see like those ads, Netflix, all these other things that don't actually have ads, right? So ads is yeah. not as effective anymore, right? So a lot of these companies are switching their brand, the, the, the brand touch points that they focus on to build their brand to other aspects of the wheel, right? So instead of pre-purchase, mm -hmm. now they're focused on, on uh, purchase and then post-purchase. So as an example, right? Like uh, I think it is, uh, shoot, I think it's Hyundai. Hyundai who has a seven year warranty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Hyundai out of nowhere, uh, they come up with this seven year warranty, whereas cars traditionally come with like a three year warranty. Some, yeah. some brands may come with like a five year warranty. And these guys, mm -hmm. now they're, they're kind of like, they're totally changing what all the other car, like it's totally separate from everything else that the other car manufacturers are doing. They say, Hey, let's do seven years. And so now that yeah. is a post purchase uh, experience that they focused on. Uh, yeah. So that, it differentiates their brand and people talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're talking about in this podcast, for example. So now I, I, coming back to all, while we're talking about this in the board games, uh, this, I kind of went into it a little bit deeper than I thought I, I was going to go into it, but really like with board games, what's really interesting about board games is this is an experience where uh, like pre-purchase and post-purchase are mixed. Right. Yeah. And here's what I mean by that. Like, Mahir brought up that like a lot of people are getting into board games through Twitch, right? So mm -hmm. it's post purchase for the people that are on Twitch that are playing it. But then it also yeah. serves as pre purchase, like marketing, advertising, because people are now watching them play it, right? Play so it's, yeah. it's kind of like crazy cycle where they're getting the best of, they're getting a touch here in post purchase and they're getting a touch um, in, in yeah. pre purchase, which is like absolutely uh, amazing. Right. And then the other thing mm -hmm. that was a recurring theme on the podcast was like, uh, Mahir kept bringing up that, like, hey, people buy this to flex. Right. And so uh, it was like a recurring. Buy that board game? The board, board yeah, game. Yeah. So, like, for example, he mentioned like people will have like collector edition board games or like certain Yu Gi Oh cards and they'll leave them out in like display oh, yeah. cases and stuff so that like when people yeah. come over or, or whatever, like it starts a conversation and it's like, hey, like I have this. Right, he's like, oh, you had this, yeah, yeah. and it starts a conversation, right? And then we talked yeah. about this with uh, with Kimo, right? I don't know if yeah. uh, you can see that in the back, but I have like a Kimo hat, which is Fernando Alonso's brand. Whereas, like, I wear that because I like inside of me, I kind of want people to ask me what this is, right? And then yeah. I can talk about racing, Formula One, and all this stuff because it's a brand yeah. that most people don't see, right? Most people aren't, right. like, unless you're actually into racing, which is even better. You'll have automatic connect. You know what I mean? And you're like, right. boom, right? Guardian racing. So those are kind of the main yeah. things that came out of that episode. Uh, I thought uh, one of the things I mentioned is that like I never thought that we'd be doing an episode on board games and branding deep dive. <laughs> but yeah. you know, there's, there's branding lessons everywhere. If you're looking for it, you can you can find them. So yeah, and I think that's one of the key takeaways of the uh, whole podcast as well. I think introducing the average person to the concept of branding is is very important because then they're aware. Uh, of it and they make decisions based on it. And so that like, I think, you know, companies in general are moving towards making themselves excellent brands as possible. So to be aware of that is really helpful uh, from both uh, entrepreneur perspective and a uh, consumer perspective. Next episode was communication with Peter George. Key takeaway number one, start with understanding who you're speaking to and the result you want out of it. And key takeaway number two, public speaking is about what you take, uh, what you can take away. So let me put you on the spot here. Did you listen to this one? No, I didn't listen to this one. Okay. All right. So <laughs> here, one of the analogies he used that was really powerful for the second key takeaway, which is public speaking is about what you can take away, not what you add, is like a sculptor, mm -hmm. right? Like a sculptor starts with like a giant 
block of whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. Like marble or whatever. And then they chip away, chip away, chip away until they have whatever their actual the sculpture is, is right at the end, right? But if you mm-hmm. just leave that entire block there, right? It's just going to be a block, right? Like no one's going to yeah, yeah. get any, like, they're not going to pay millions of dollars for a block, right? A block, yeah. Uh, and so with, with the lesson there is that a lot of times, and I, if you listen back to this episode, you'll notice this, we're like, we're just talking and I could probably remove 90% of what, I, of what I'm saying and still get the essence of what it is that I was saying, which is, mm-hmm. you know, like a fault of me, right? And I'm, I'm sorry that you had to mm. sit through that, but um, yeah, right, I'm like that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, that's the, that's the point is like, look, you want to make your speech and your, your speaking concise, clear, uh, and effective. It's not necessarily yeah. like one thing he said is like, no one ever complained that the speaker didn't speak long enough. Right. But mm-hmm. they all, but they will complain when you go over. Right. Yeah. So if you communicate what it is you're trying to communicate in fewer words, that's better than going over. Right. Yeah. And, one of the and this relates to, go ahead. well, I guess let me just connect it back. This relates to brand strategy design from the perspective of like copywriting for your product service on your website or on whatever you were using to explain what you do. Yeah. So in terms of, so branding, right, this episode uh, was more about your personal brand and Mm -hmm. how it is to speak and present yourself. Um, So in terms of like the brand aspect, that's more of what we were focused on. But yeah, that that is a good point Mm -hmm. in terms of like marketing and, and really like effective communication is no different whether it's in marketing, in, in branding, in copy, or it's in public speaking, right? All the lessons you right. take from this episode, you yeah. can apply to any of your marketing material. Um, got it, got it. And then like starting with uh, understanding who you're speaking to, that's like the same thing as uh, understanding your target audience that we always talk about. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna uh, spend any more time talking about that because I feel like our audience at this point already has, is. It's probably sick and tired of hearing know yeah. your target audience and study them. If you're not sick yet, <laughs> by mid-2022, I'm sure you'll be sick. <laughs> yeah. MMA, uh, mixed martial arts, we had a, uh, our guest, Sifu Harun Raja, who runs uh, a mixed martial arts academy. Key takeaway from his episode was actions speak louder than words. And number two, don't be afraid to ask for help. Walk us through those real quick. Yeah, so this one I consider more of a – general business best practices and like life lessons episode more than a more than it was like a branding deep dive um Mm -hmm. now there are definitely branding lessons in there and we can extract those but one thing one of the things that like from a branding standpoint is important to know here is that the power of trends right like Mm -hmm. martin newbuyer in his book uh what's his book called uh, Zach, right? In his book, one thing. Yeah. He, one, oh, the newest one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's the newest one, but like one of the things he mentioned is like, look, it's a lot easier to find a parade and just get in front of it than it is to create your own parade. Right. And mm-hmm. so one of the questions I asked uh, Sifu Harun Raja was like, hey, Kung Fu Panda, John Wick, all these other movies that are coming out, how much of an effect do they have on your actual bottom line? Right. Like, are people actually coming in to your place? Yeah. Uh, as a result of watching these movies, because I personally, I love martial arts movies. Like they're, they're so awesome. Just the choreography. And then also like, they're also all about like respect and stuff. You know what I mean? Like, it's also like yeah. honor and respect. It's just like, you, like you can't help, but love those people that are actually, you know, have the discipline and all that stuff. So, you know, he mentioned that like, well, there was a guy that came literally, he was like, I want to be John wick. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I remember that. so like he was saying that, it definitely does have a big impact in increasing interest mm-hmm. and awareness. And people do come in strictly off of, you know, watching a movie and they get inspired and they'll come in. Right. And so mm-hmm. that's one thing that's the, the lesson here is really, it's not a key takeaway that I put in there, but really like looking back at this episode from a branding standpoint, I would say is like, understand the trends that are going on and how you can be, uh, how you can position yourself to kind of ride that wave, right? Like riding a wave Mm -hmm. will help you a lot more than just trying to create your own wave, right? Yeah. Um, Like, for for example, we did an episode on Christopher Nolan. We did an episode on Intel versus Mac. 
those episodes mm-hmm. on YouTube, because that like there was a period of time where they were trending those two topics. Uh, also, like I think uh, the the figs. Dude, so so all right. So we did a clip <laughs> on, on figs, yeah. and since the day we posted it, it has not. It'll every day it'll get like one or two views, and it's not like <laughs> it's not like doing a crazy amount of views or anything like that, but it's consistent. It's like people are still searching figs people and it's there, right? It's a trend that you can just yeah. kind of hop on. And same thing with so like Christopher Nolan. Uh, when we posted it, I think we got like 20 views, right? Like we don't mm-hmm. push our YouTube, so we don't get too much views over there. But mm-hmm. then all of a sudden in January, what happened is Christopher Nolan kind of lashed out on, I think it was on HBO for releasing movies at the same time as... Uh, Tenet. Uh, yeah, so like the theatrical release and the actual like streaming release, he was he was a big uh, he didn't theater like guy. He wanted people yeah. to watch it in e- theaters. Yeah. Exactly. So there was like a bunch of articles that came out, and so he was in the news, and immediately on that we got like eighty views in like a day, right? And like if yeah. you go to our site, uh, our YouTube page, that's one of our most viewed uh, videos, and that's strictly because of a trend that happened, right? And so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that was kind of just like luck, right? We weren't expecting that to happen, but uh, right. right, like it's finding these trends and doubling down, and really creating content for those trends will help you in terms of discoverability, searchability, and people finding you. Uh, that's something yeah. we don't do a good enough job of because frankly, we do this like part-time and we're trying to yeah. uh, just kind of learn as much as we can, not trying to get on trends, but yeah, it definitely um, helps. And then, you know, the other like lessons here, uh, I would say like really check the episode out. Um, th- what I would say in this episode, another like branding thing from those key takeaways was uh, th- he had, Sifu Raja has like, and in martial arts culture, like having mentors and teachers is like a big aspect, right? Like mm-hmm. everything you do is from, uh, you, you know, you consult your teachers and all this stuff. And so that was a big theme throughout that whole episode. And one of the things mm-hmm. that we talked about, even in that figs short that we did was right. Like if you have people that are, you know, above you, you have people that are have oversight. Exactly. If you have some people you can consult yeah. and they have your best interests in mind and they're able to kind of advise you and guide you, right? Like you're able to avoid a lot of these mistakes and missteps and stuff that you, that may cause you uh, a lot of problems in your brand. So yeah, yeah. those are kind of That's my good. high level thoughts. Yeah. There. So we had Amani, um, the founder of Not Your Basic Batch on Instagram. She runs a bakery company. Um, this was a good episode. One of her, one of the key takeaways, free samples are super important. Uh, it goes with the saying, try before you buy. Um, that's one thing that she found was very helpful for her brand. Key takeaway number two, understand and use quality cues. And I'll let you explain what those are. And number three, strict control of supply and demand. I added that third key takeaway, which I can elaborate on, but go ahead. Yeah. So um, the first one, free samples, I think is pretty uh, self-explanatory. And I think people in the food space generally understand this, right? Like Costco, you go in there, there's free samples all the time, right? Like people understand the value of free samples. uh, But this is a a lesson you can apply in any business you're in, right? Like doing giveaways, like Amani is big on giveaways. And the other thing that she does a lot of is, uh, so like, she'll add an extra pastry, even though you didn't order it, right? Like yeah. it's always about over delivering and giving the customer something that they didn't expect. And that's something that like, yeah. like there's no substitute for that, right? Like if you can go above and give, make the customer feel like you gave them more value than what they paid for, there's no way mm-hmm. that you're not gonna do well in business, right? Like just- that, That's a good way to put it. That's essentially what you're doing with yep. the giveaways, yeah. And then the second thing, so quality cues, are uh, ways to signal to your target audience that you have a quality product. And then you're able to charge a higher premium on price because people know that it's a quality product, right? So for example, (laughs) right, like Apple, when we look at the products that Apple has, the packaging is nice, right? Like I have a Mac mini here, like it's this silver, uh, like it just feels nice. It looks nice. It's, it's on my table. It looks nice. It has a little black Apple thing. If you touch it, I don't know what material this is, but it's like, you know what I mean? It like titanium. Yeah. So the the outside is titanium, but the Apple is like a different oh. material. So 
Uh Um, It's like little things like that, right? And so in her example, so you have to understand in your industry what the quality cues are. So like Mm -hmm. in the car industry, a quality cue may be just saying that this car was handcrafted. Well, what's the, what's the, like Ferraris or what was it called when you make everything by hand, right? Like yeah. that is a quality cue, right? And it, mm-hmm. what if like the, the people that are making it by hand are not even talented? <laughs> yeah. It may be better yeah. if it's like machine done, but like the, right. the point is like just adding that allows you to p- charge a significant premium automatically, right? Yeah. Now, another quality cue um, in, in cars is like the trim of like the seats, Right. Or yeah. like the trim of the actual, uh, like if you have dashboard or yeah, like carbon fiber in there and stuff like that, yeah. right. All that stuff. Right. Those are quality cues. The, the, the speakers, right. Like if it has like a, like bang and Olufsen speakers, right. Like those are going to be a higher end, like it's a quality cue. Right. And so right, right. in the food space, the quality cues that she uses or she, that I kind of noticed that she uses are right. Like she has nice packaging that's branded. Right. And then, mm-hmm. In the food space, it's really the ingredients you use, right? Like mm-hmm. she is very particular about the ingredients she uses and make sure she uses the, the best quality products um, in her product. And then how they look at the end, right? Like yeah. the pastries look good, right? And then on Instagram, what she does is making sure that the pictures and videos are high quality, right? And she shows mm-hmm. the whole process. And those are quality cues there too, right? Like if, if you go to an Instagram page and the the pictures aren't good and the, the food doesn't look appetizing, then in yeah. your mind, you're signaling to your customers that, hey, this is probably not that good. It's not worth a lot of money, right? I, I laughed so hard when you brought that up in the episode. <laughs> you're like, well, if the food doesn't look good, you're not gonna wanna buy it. And it's funny, cause you know, we talk about like food porn, like visual visual communication in the food industry is very important. That's a very important quality cue. So yeah. I was just like, wow, yeah, that's true. And then she reflected on it too, cause one of the advices that she got was like, oh, you gotta keep producing content, you gotta keep producing content. But then she understood her quality cue so well that she was like, well, no, it might work for just, you know, something else. But our, my product is a food product. Quality is very important in this case. And she realized that lower lower qual- quantity, but consistency was more important than keep producing in terms of quantity. Uh, so I thought that was, that was a pretty deep take, too. Yeah, there's so on her uh, business in general, like another thing that she's kind of that we didn't really touch on in the episode as much, but like. One, like one thing that I admire about it is like she has customers that are local, right? That she's able mm-hmm. to kind of engage on Instagram, right? And like mm-hmm. as soon as like Instagram is up and running, boom, like you know she has another drop this week. And then like, oh yeah, we, so actually you, you're going to talk about it in your thing and the supply and demand. So why don't you touch on your, yeah. your takeaway there? And then we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. I mean, well, uh, one thing I thought was so fascinating was that she has a strict control of her supply and demand, meaning that she knows her capacity of producing what she pr- provides and creates a demand through that by limiting the supply. Um, so she's a one man team, from what I understood from the episode. Um, she makes her own, you know, very well crafted bakery items and then builds a demand around it. And then there's like an exclusivity element to what she provides just because of her limitation. And it actually works a lot in her favor. She talked about when she started a pop-up shop, wherever it was supposed to be a three hour long event, you know, in one hour she was sold out and then people were upset, but then they just created more demand and then it allowed for more, uh, you know, delivery the next time around. So I thought that was very fascinating, especially when we look at some of the episodes that we talked about in the past, Figs does this really well. They have a very low supply and that allows them to create demand. So I was just reflecting on the similarities there. I was like, wow, this this is a good power. This is a good, powerful point. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of, I mean, you see like Supreme and stuff, they do it artificially, right? Like people oh, yeah, yeah. like artificially will constrict supply so that demand goes up. But in this case, yeah, what is uh, th- the real genius in this strategy is that you're not wasting your materials. My favorite thing about that episode was when she was like, yeah, I would get views and engagements with pictures of food. But then when I started showing myself biting into the food and eating the food, like views and engagement spiked up. I was like, wow, that's crazy. So the thing that surprised me most about that episode is how she said, like, literally when she posts reels, she'll get three times the sales or something like that. Right. Like, and I was mm-hmm. like, the more I think about it, the more I realize that, like, if you're in the B2B space, then mm-hmm. posting on Instagram and social media is more about social proof. 
right? Like, mm-hmm. hey, I know how to do this or whatever. But if you're yeah. in the product consumer space, then mm-hmm. like there is a direct correlation between how much you post and how the quality of your posts and the amount of sales you have, right? So mm-hmm. if you're direct to consumer, you need to be on these platforms. You need to be posting your stuff uh, and doing all you can to push on these. But if you're in like a B2B mm-hmm. space, then it's not so much about, you're not gonna get clients for your brand strategy company. Uh, like for, for, for example, for us, like by posting clips of branding deep dive, we're not gonna get branding uh, strategy clients. But what it will do is show if someone looks us up, they could be like, oh, okay, they have all these clips talking to these people and, you know, they must know what they're talking about. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Clever proof, yeah. B2B for the people that are listening is business to business. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Last episode, uh, launch good with Chris Blauvelt. Uh, we had so many different, so many good takeaways in this short episode. It was a fantastic episode. Number one, the founder nuance, you know, founders and entrepreneurs tend to be stubborn but it's important for them to be able to pivot. Uh, Number two, relentlessly resourceful. This was something that Paul Graham realized in his Y Combinator uh, um, experience, uh, is that entrepreneurs that are the most successful are relentlessly resourceful. Number three, I added a couple uh, things. Believe in what you do, uh, and you'll never be sorry about pitching. And then number four, uh, is your idea a billion-dollar idea? I remember someone asked Chris Blavelt that about LaunchKit, and he was like kind of hesitant, and I thought it was very important uh, lesson there. And number five, uh, how uh, to make people love to pay to donate. And the answer that he gave was beautiful. He said that, um, you know, paying is a way of showing is putting your money where your mouth is, right? So, so you can say all you want. Oh, yeah, I believe in this. I think this is important. But paying is a way you can believe you can show people that. And I thought that was an amazing framing of donation or charity in general. It's like, oh, you, you believe in this? Well, pay, pay up. And that's how launch could kind of, uh, I mean, they don't use that specific target, but I remember him briefly saying it where he was like, well, you know, pain is how you show uh, what is really important to you. So I thought that was an interesting key takeaway. And those key takeaways, for me, what I found most interesting, and I, like the founder nuance is something I labeled. I don't know if that's actually what it's called or whatever, um, is that like, look, when it comes to external forces, when it comes to people that are outside looking in, you need to make sure that you are strong in your vision and you're not willing to waver at all. You have to be stubborn to that. But then when it comes to your customers, you need to be willing to change over and over again until you get what it is that they actually want and need from you. And the example mm-hmm. of this was, you know, when they started out, uh, you know, they started out as more of like a Kickstarter for like creative ideas and stuff like that. But they found that the community project. is not actually that's not what they actually want and need from LaunchKit. What they want and need is a way to uh, fund uh, charity projects, right? Like uh, relief and stuff like that. And it's funny, like the way Chris talked about it, he's like, when we started out, like, you know, people would come and ask if they could put their charity on. They're like, yeah, sure, go ahead. You know, like, 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 yeah. <laughs> he was like, yeah, like, they're, you know. They're like ahead. a side side project, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, they're like, hey, I'm the man, don't worry about this, uh, whatever. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be, too, shouldn't be too hard to run this. <laughs> right. And, and so the other thing, um, one of the main awesome things uh, from this one was, like, you were one of those people that were, uh, like, you were a Launch Good Fellow, right? And so one of the things we talked about was, like, how – he had people assigned to actually walk through and give a personalized experience to the campaign creators uh, and mm-hmm. how that was one of the ways that they differentiated themselves from their competition. One of the things he talked about is like, there's always room for personalization, right? And mm-hmm. so if you're in a space where you're trying to figure out how to differentiate yourselves, and I think we can, again, bring it back to Falcon Notes, right? Like one of the, like for us, like, I, at least for me, it was like, how do I answer the question? How is Falcon Notes different? I was like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so what we did is the, it, it differentiate ourselves with that personalization. It's like, hey, we literally mm-hmm. do custom journals for people, mm-hmm. like from start to finish. Right? And so that's kind yeah. of, there's always space, whatever space you're in, personalized experience, personalized service, always room for that. To wrap up this episode, uh, I want to t- get your take on how you think the podcast has grown from our first episode on um, the, the uh, Ford Bronco to our most latest episode with Launch Good. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of thoughts on mine, especially from the perspective of having stepped away from the podcast a little bit and going back to it and having to listen to some episodes. Yeah, I'm interested to hear your perspective, but since you asked the question, I'll go first. Um, one of the things that I will 
advise all people that are trying to create content in some way or create something is like, again, this is a lesson from Chris's episode and some of the other episodes is like, you get more clarity as you go, right? Like mm -hmm. as you go, it becomes clearer and clearer what it is that you should be doing and what, what gap you have, how you can serve your customers. When we started our podcast, like we were like our intro from when we started the podcast to right now is completely different, right? Like mm -hmm. now it's a lot more clear and like, Hey, when you're listening to this podcast this is what you're listening to. Right. And we communicate it differently uh, and it, it'll change again, uh, probably in the next couple of weeks uh, and stuff like that. But one of the things that is really, I found is that like, now I know what gap I'm trying to go for. And after kind of taking a lot of these kind of courses and stuff as well is like, I, I know, in the branding space, what space I want Branding Deep Dive to occupy. And I don't think I would have ever gotten there had we not started creating all this content. And then in terms yeah. of like actual show stuff, right? Like actual, I think as a host, I would say reflecting back, I think I got better. Um, and then also like one thing that I'll credit Ruffy for is like, up until episode what, like 16, like I said, all we did was uh, people we knew. And I mm -hmm. was of this opinion that, hey, I'm not gonna reach out to people until I feel like I have a good enough product so that when they mm -hmm. come on, they're not just wasting their time, right? Yeah. And that was my whole thing is like, hey, our podcast is not good enough. And I knew we'll get there eventually. But then uh, as a joke, like Ruffy's like, Hey, you want to get Chris on? And, and like me and you had been talking about getting Chris is one of the first names we talked about because of, yeah. you know, we want to talk about launch kit, but we knew we we're not ready to have Chris on yet. We knew yeah. we we're at this stage. It's not going to be a good enough episode. Right. And mm -hmm. so Ruffy as a joke, he's like, Hey, you want me to reach out? I can reach out. I was like, fine, go ahead, man. Um, and so he did. And I was thinking Chris is not going to accept. So whatever, like, you know, and by the way, Ahmed Shima still doesn't have Chris Blavel's number, so he's been asking me to come in. <laughs> that, that's, that's, how, that's how much of a gap there is between Ahmed Shima. Like, you know, when he says people you don't know, Ahmed Shima does not know Chris Blavel. <laughs> no, no, like, we see each other, like, we're in the same community. Yeah. I just, the, the conversation has never come up to, like, ask his right, answers right, right. over, right? So, to clarify that. I just thought it was funny when you're like, hey, I don't have a number, can you send these links to him? I was like, bro, you did a whole episode. <laughs> yeah, but, um... So Chris accepts to my surprise. And then I'm like, oh shoot, now I got to actually take this seriously. And then from that yeah. point, I was like, okay, if Chris accepted, that means other people may be willing to accept as well. And so yeah. what this year has been, uh, a const has been a constant state of kind of getting out of my shell and pushing myself to do bigger and bigger, uh, prepping harder and harder. I think there are a couple episodes here and there that I think I winged it and I didn't do a good enough job, but I think I'm gonna post anyway, just cause you know, I had guests on, um, and I'm sorry for the audience that doesn't get as much value out of those and feels like it's a waste of time. But I, I do think it's, it, I think it's good to document the journey. I, think so, I know some people would just kind of trash the episode, but I think there's a, it's a good way to document it and look back. So yeah, I, I would say those are the, the main things, um, really in terms of the, again, to recap, right. How I feel the podcast has grown, uh, this year, of course, the listeners and all the numbers and all that stuff has been good as well. Uh, been learning a lot in that process. Uh, one thing I, I learned is how hard it is to actually book people um, <laughs> and how hard it is to actually grow a podcast. Uh, it's mm -hmm. easy to make a podcast. It's not easy to grow a podcast, right? Yeah. Like, that's one yeah. thing that you, you find out very quickly. And I think that's one thing that why you see a lot of people start podcasts and they drop off is because no one actually listens to podcasts like they think they do, right? Like people yeah, yeah. listen to Joe Rogan. And people think right. that all those people that listen to Joe Rogan are going to start listening to you. <laughs> That's yeah. not, it's not going to happen. No way. Sorry to break it to you. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so if you're thinking of starting a podcast, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're thinking of starting a podcast, you're, you're going to have like three downloads. You, you, you'll have your mom, you have your initial. That was, like, that, remember that was a running joke at the beginning to our three listeners. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> it was like me, you and Rafi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, you will have that initial spike. And I've seen that, yeah. in like, you know, when you start a project, you have that initial spike, people are like, oh, cool, you're starting something new. But then most people will yeah. not stick around till episode 28, right? You'll get yeah. four or five, six, seven, maybe 10 people that are listening consistently, right? And then every yeah. once in a while, when you get a bigger guest, you'll get a little spike. But unless you're running ads and doing active outreach, 
you're not going to grow your podcast yeah. like you you think you're gonna you're not gonna just make it big out of nowhere unless i mean of course there, yeah. there's examples of of people kind of getting lucky if you find the right trend and stuff like that but, right. but really if you're uh just talking about random stuff like good luck one thing i would say listening to you uh, at the beginning of this episode but also listening to you on the latest episode we launched it is that you have definitely improved your hosting skills so that was that was cool to see uh and the other thing i really think is what's interesting is that we have been able to deliver better and better value to our listeners i i think we're able to pull the value out of our um yes if we thought that we were doing a good job before we're definitely doing a better job now and the way i think about it the reason why i was thinking about this was like literally on my interviews with med, with uh, residency programs i have podcasts as my hobby and you know they ask about hobbies they ask about podcasts and some of the people like i said have been some of the doctors like people are, like not related to you know they you know branding and strategy design this is not what they think about they're listening to the podcast they're like oh this is kind of interesting and i was like do you feel like it's helpful to you they're like oh not really like i don't really have um uh something i want to work on the brand for and stuff like that um, but then yeah, I would come across people that were like, oh yeah, you know, these were episodes, early episodes were good. And I would be like kind of shy from like, uh, t- telling them to listen to specific episodes. But then as I started listening to the later ones, I was like, oh dude, these are amazing. Like I kind of, like I told you, I was like, man, I can't, I'm excited for 2022 to see with, you know, I have a little bit more time to be able to contribute to this. And one of the inspirations for telling you that was that I was like, wow, some of these episodes are really, really good. So I think that's the main thing I took away. Um, so to add to that, I think the reason why they've been getting better against like there's the, the reps piece, but in terms of like finding those uh, like gems is because we're actually working on something ourselves. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. When we, like it, like we're actually going through a lot of these problems ourselves. And then of course, both me and you have been in situations where we're advising clients and uh, you know, nonprofit organizations and small businesses and stuff like that. But that's yeah. like, we're a little bit disconnected from that, right? And then right. what the lens we kind of bring in, uh, I feel, to a lot of these conversations is like, hey, we're trying to learn because like like with Chris's episode, is directly a lot of these questions are like, hey, how do I actually do this for myself, right? And I'm trying mm-hmm. to figure that out. And so I think that helps a lot and really bring that beginner's mindset. If you're, if you're a podcast that's trying to be educational, you have to bring that like beginner's mindset and make sure that you're mm. trying to learn from every person that you are um, uh, actually, uh, you know, talking to. And what really helps in that space is not only listening and, you know, trying that, but like if you're also trying to implement a lot of this stuff outside of it, it helps you, right? And you have stories you can tell. Mm-hmm. I think for me, one thing that I've noticed and, um, you know, I, I, I say this when I pitch the podcast, to people who ask what it's about. And I give the example, I say, we're branding deep dive. We look at brand strategy design from companies and, but we don't look at big companies. We don't look at Nike and Apple. We look at small companies as part of my pitch for the podcast. And one thing I realized is that we do look at small companies and growing companies that have, you know, that are in a very infantile stage of their, uh, of their growth. And I think the lesson that we hear time and again, if you listen to these episodes is, that concept of, you know, doing non expandable things, you know, we understand that. And we understand the value of it from hearing all the different examples. But I think if you are a listener who has a product that they're trying to start a business around, um, like myself and Ahmachima included with Falcon Notes, it becomes a reality where you start having to do those small things that are not scalable, and they require a lot of effort, time and energy that don't have the results or return that you might expect, but they're almost critical for your growth. Um, and you hear this in every single episode, everywhere from Gymshark to Launch Good to Bakery to, you know, every single episode, I feel like is we, we touch on it where like there's certain things that you have to do that uh, to b- develop that trust and they're not really scalable that eventually will become, you have to find a way to become scalable, but you need that first step of doing things that aren't scalable. So um, it's a great thing to hear over and over again. And also if you are starting a business, um, start to consider how you're going to implement it. So yeah, that's my uh, big takeaway from 2021. I'm excited to see what we have in store for 2022. And uh, that wraps up this podcast, I guess. If you enjoyed this discussion, please consider leaving a review and sharing with a friend. We've got lots of cool stuff planned for 2022. So stick around and we'll see you next week.